many years ago, um, I had to, for a short season in life, I had to take a job that was out of town uh, from where Michelle and I were living at the time. And when I did that, uh, whenever you worked at it, out of town in the construction industry, that means living in a hotel. Now, if you've ever lived, or if you've ever worked in construction, or you've ever uh, been involved in a number of secular construction pro projects, you, you know the folks who live and work in construction are somewhat rough around the edges. And uh, my roommate, when because everybody had to be two people to a hotel room, you didn't get your own hotel room, and. And my roommate was the uh, person who no one else wanted to stay with. You know what we'll do with this guy? We'll give him to Mike. Um, and to say, that he was, to say that he was rough around the edges would be uh, putting it mildly. Uh, several times in our little over two months together, he came into the room well after midnight in a drunken mess. Uh, cursing was a regular part of his vocabulary, and uh, his, his mind was not on wholesome things for the most part. A very, very hard guy to be a roommate with. And over the course of a couple months, when you live and work together with uh, people in those kind of circumstances, you have the opportunity to share the gospel, and they have the opportunity to see you in all kinds of circumstances. And I'll never forget one day in particular, there were problems between the employees, the guys that I was working with, and the home office. There was some question about how much money they were getting paid to eat every day. There was some question about travel expenses, etc., etc. And I vividly remember having a telephone conversation with the manager at our home office while there was two or three employees standing around. And subconsciously, as I was having this conversation with the home office, and this has maybe happened to you before in your life, but subconsciously what I was doing as I was having that conversation with the home office is I was making myself look really fantastic, like a really good employee, and I was making the other guys look like complainers and whiners. And my roommate sat quietly through the whole conversation, and he listened to the whole thing. It was maybe a five or a ten minute conversation with the home office, and as soon as I hit and he lit into me like nobody's business. Who do you think you are making yourself look so fantastic and us look like a bunch of whiners and complainers? And he was irate. He, he was like twice the size of me too, at least twice as strong as me, and he could have seriously injured me. So I was a little bit afraid for a moment. Um, but when he finished his tirade, I looked at him, and I said, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And I said, I'm sorry. Would you, would you please forgive me? I was wrong in what I said. And I was wrong to say the things that I said to our boss. And I learned that day from my roommate who was rough around the edges uh, I, I, I'd learned this lesson before in my Christian walk, but this day was a particularly poignant moment when I realized how prideful I am. How self-focused I can often be. Now, who would have thought that a godless man would teach me such a powerful lesson in that moment? Doesn't God do that from time to time? Doesn't God use unexpected people and unexpected circumstances to teach us powerful lessons in our life? Well, that's what we have this morning in our text. If you turn there again, Mark chapter 7, we have an unlikely person teaching us a powerful lesson. We meet a woman who has some things to teach us about asking God for things. Would you agree that, uh, you, you, I don't think you have to be a great Bible scholar to know that praying 
talking with God, pleading with God is important in the Christian life. Would you agree with that? And this woman has some important things to teach us, and she's not who you might expect to give us such a powerful lesson. But as often is the case, the Lord uses unlikely people to show us extraordinary things. Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. Here we meet a woman in a desperate situation who comes to Jesus looking for help. It says here in the text that she begs Jesus. She's pleading with him for his help. And she has some important things to teach us about pleading with God. Here's the first thing. God allows us to plead with him. We are able, as believers, we are able to come before the God who transcends everything, who is above all, who is completely distinct from all creation, because He permits it. That's why we can plead with God, because God allows us to plead with Him. Mark describes the situation for us, first of all, by telling us, about Jesus traveling somewhere and about what he does when he gets there. Look with me at verse 24. Jesus left that place, so this is probably the area of Gennesaret, the the last location that Mark gives us in the gospel of where Jesus was. It says he left that place and he went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Now, if you know a little bit of geography in the world, of the, of the ancient world, in, in the nation of Israel, then you know Tyre is a place that is outside the border of Egypt. It's, it's north of Egypt and it's west of Egypt. It's right on the Mediterranean Sea. And the city of Tyre was inhabited mainly by non-Jewish people whom the Bible refers to as Gentiles. So when you read the Bible, you, you, you often see that phrase, Gentile. There's Jews who are the nation of Israel, and then there's Gentiles, which is everybody else. It is a place that history uh, records as having a great deal of conflict with the nation of Israel. In fact, the great historian, the ancient historian Josephus, calls Tyre among the most bitter enemies of, among the, most bitter enemies of the nation of Israel. In addition to having a people that were hostile to the nation of Israel, we also find in Tyre a people who were ignorant of God's word. They didn't know anything about the Bible. These were people who rejected the true God of the universe and had embraced false religion. So why in the world does Jesus go to a place like that? Why does Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, why does he end up in Tyre? Well, if we take Jesus' reason for entering the house that he does when he gets there as our clue, then we'll, we should be able to discover the answer. Look at what it says at the second half of the verse. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. He wanted to get some solitude. He wanted to get a period of isolation. You might recall that before the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus had gone to that remote place where this great crowd shows up and he performs this great miracle. He goes to that place to get some rest, some peace and quiet with his disciples, but it was to no avail. He, he jumped in the boat with his disciples and he tried to go to a solitary place, but somebody saw them and they ran down on foot and they got there ahead of them and there's this great crowd waiting for Christ and he continues to minister. So there's no rest. He has found no rest for him and his disciples. We also need to remember the great hostility that's begun to be been shown to Jesus by the religious leaders. There's lots of reasons why Jesus wanted a period of rest, a period of isolation. So Jesus retreats. He goes all the way outside the borders of Israel. He goes all the way to Tyre, a place where there's very few Jews, a place where there's no one who knows about the Scriptures. And he goes there to get separated from the crowds. Now that is a picture of, I think that's a picture of the separation that exists between God and humanity. There is a barrier between God and human beings. There is a separation between us and the Lord because of our sin. We are isolated from God. 
What right does anyone have to come into the presence of God? What right do we have to be here this morning and worship together and sing praises to God Almighty? What right do we have? We don't have a right. We're separated from the Lord. And God would be perfectly just in cutting us off from Himself and leaving us to wallow in the misery of our sin. But God providentially allows for Jesus' presence here to be made known. And God providentially allows for us in His plan of redeeming a people to Himself through the history of the world, He allows for us to come into His presence. That, I think that's the picture. Here is Jesus who is separated from everybody and then this woman comes crashing into His presence. In fact, it says, Mark here tells us that He could not keep His presence secret. I love what the great commentator Matthew Henry says about this verse. Thinking about Jesus being truly God. He's truly man, but he's also truly God. Henry writes this about this verse. He says, though a candle can be put under a bushel, the sun cannot. You understand that? So if you have a, a little candle in a room, you can take a, a bushel or a basket, you can put it over the candle and you can conceal the light. You can't put a basket over the sun. It's impossible to conceal the glory or the light of the sun. In other words, what, what Matthew Henry is trying to say about this verse about Jesus not being able to keep his presence secret is that Jesus so exudes the glory of God that it is impossible for Jesus to keep his divinity hidden, the glory of his divinity hidden. I love the way Henry writes that because in, instead of seeing this as a limitation of Jesus, instead of seeing this as something that Jesus can't do, it's a picture of Jesus' infinite greatness that can't be concealed. No one can conceal the glory of God. So having established this picture of separation of Jesus trying to get by himself of being alone in this house, Mark introduces to us a woman who comes to Jesus. You see here, we meet her in verses 25 and through 26. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell on his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia, she begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. She's a Greek, which means that likely means that she was speaking Greek to the Lord Jesus. She's originally, we're told here, she's originally from Syrian Phoenicia, which tells us that she is a thoroughly Gentile woman. There is not a scrap, there is not a piece of Jewish blood in her body. She's completely Gentile. Now that's important because it's telling us that she does not belong in the presence of Jesus. She is a Gentile. Jesus is a Jew. She is not part of God's chosen people. Jesus is. She does not belong there. Any soccer fans this morning? Have you been following? There's like two soccer fans in the whole church. Anybody been following the World Cup? Right now they're, they're, they're playing the World Cup. I think it's France and Croatia in the final. Is that right? Have they played the final yet? No, they, it's still to come. So imagine, now, we don't get too geared up about soccer. At least I don't know too many people who get geared up about soccer in these parts. But in most of the world, soccer is a huge game. I think it might be the biggest sporting event in the world like thousands and thousands there's there's soccer stadiums in brazil that will seat a hundred thousand people if you can believe it and people are super passionate about soccer actually in most of the world they call it football or football maybe if you say it with an accent people are really excited now imagine how passionate people can be about soccer there's actually people who die at soccer games because people are so passionate about who's playing who in various stadiums around the world. I mean, it gets pretty intense. Now imagine, you got the final of the World Cup of Soccer, and you've got France and Croatia. Now just imagine for a moment that the Croatian team runs out of water bottles, and they say, you know what we can do? We'll go over to France's locker room, and we'll ask them for a water bottle. <laughs> There's no way that's going to happen, right? What are they going to do? They're going to slam the door 
in their face because the Croatian players don't belong in France's dressing room, right? Like when it comes to sporting events and soccer, for that moment when they're about to take the field, they're bitter enemies. They're not friends. They're not going to loan you the water bottle. There's no way. They'd throw you out of the dressing room. Well, knowing the culture of Jesus' day, that's what we would expect to happen here. When this woman comes into Jesus, she finds out Jesus is there. Jesus wants some alone time. He wants solitude. When she comes, crashes into the room, crashes into His presence, what we would expect to see is Jesus saying, get that woman out of here. She doesn't belong. And yet, as she comes into Jesus' presence, notice notice how she does it here. Right? Look at the end of verse 25. She's begging and pleading with him, and she comes and she falls at his feet, like face to the ground, probably sobbing, pleading with Jesus to cast this demon away from her daughter. Jesus could have cast her out. He could have commanded that she would be removed. But instead, what happens here? She's allowed to remain. She falls at the feet of Jesus and He allows her to stay there. She's pleading with Christ for her daughter to be freed from Satan. Which, by the way, is a good thing to pray to God for your children. Which, by the way, is a good thing to plead with God for your neighbor. Is that they would be freed from the clutches, the grasp, the deceit, the tyranny of the forces of evil. That's an important picture for us to engrave upon our minds this woman who comes and is pleading with Christ. What right do we have to come into the presence of God and plead with Him about anything? We don't. And yet, He allows her to remain. And did you know... I I hope you know this, that in the book of Hebrews, we're told in God's Word that we are allowed to come into the Holy of Holies, into the throne room of heaven by the blood of Christ. We can come and we can plead with God because He allows it. Why do I waste that privilege so often in my life? We have, the, we have the ability. God permits us to come and to plead with Him and to pray and to offer our requests to Him. And I squander it daily. I squander it. What a privilege to come and to plead with God. There's a word of caution for us, though, here in these verses that Jesus offers. While God permits us to come and to plead with Him in regards to the things that burden our hearts and to the, and to regards to the things that we want to see Him do and accomplish in our life, it is no guarantee that He will grant our request. Just because God allows us to come into His presence doesn't mean He's going to do what we ask. We see that here in Jesus' response to this woman, which is unexpected. There's not too many people who have an image of Jesus being a kind and compassionate and gentle person who expect Him to say something like this to this woman. It's even shocking to our ears. He gives us a second important consideration when pleading with God. Here's the second. God responds to Please, based on His plans and purposes. Our only hope in this life and in the next is God choosing to act in history to deliver His people. Of God choosing to answer our pleas. God responds to our pleas based on His plans and purposes. Jesus responds to this woman's plea for her daughter to be freed from the clutches of Satan with a short parable. Listen to this in verse 27. This is Jesus. Kind, gentle, compassionate Jesus. This is what he says. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her. It is not right. It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Whoa! 
If you go to Matthew chapter 15, I encourage you to read this. Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. There's this same instance that's recorded recorded in Matthew's gospel, and it becomes quite clear in Matthew that when Jesus is referring to children, he's referring to the people of Israel. Guess who he's referring to when he uses the term dogs? He's referring to Gentiles. So the children are, are, are the people of Israel, and the dogs are Gentiles. He calls this woman a dog. This woman who I hope, as we're reading this, we have some empathy for her situation, that we, we, are, we are entering into her sorrow, entering into her situation that is so difficult and traumatic. And he calls her a dog. Well, that's pretty harsh. Would you agree? Especially when you consider that the Jewish view of dogs in Jesus' day is extremely low. Even if you have the nicest image of, uh, you know, the little purse dogs that we have these days, the nice little house pets that we cater to in our culture, I mean, even if you have the cutest dog in your mind, the nicest dog that you can imagine, he still calls her a dog. The key to understanding what Jesus says here is not to try and soften his language. I... I read a number of commentaries on this text, and they're all trying to soften what Jesus says, to try and make Jesus not look as harsh or not look as mean or as bad as he seems to by calling this woman a dog. That's not the answer. The answer is not to soften what Jesus says here, but rather is to get the right meaning. Look again at the beginning of verse 27. What does it say there? The very first word is, first, let the children eat all they want. What he's pointing to here is the order of priority in the revelation of the kingdom of God. The order of priority in God's plan of redeeming people in the history of the world. The Bible makes it extremely clear. All the way from Genesis to the end of Revelation, it makes it extremely clear that God's plan for redeeming the world comes through the nation of Israel. We find this in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where God says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation, first for the Jew, and then for the Gentile. So in God's sovereign plan, He chooses this dude from nowhere named Abraham. And he makes him, he gives him a a child, a miraculous child, and he makes him into a nation. God, in his sovereign plan, rescues the people of people of Israel from Egypt. God establishes them in the promised land and makes them a nation. It is God who sovereignly promises that a a Messiah will come who is a who is a descendant of the great Israelite King David. And so it is that Jesus is born in Bethlehem of the house and line of David. There's a lot of other things I can see, but I want I could say, but I want you to see this is that God's plan, his purpose for redeeming people from every tribe, tongue and nation in the world. Praise the Lord, we can be included in that. God's plan for redeeming people from every tribe, tongue and nation in the world begins with Israel. You say well, why? Why does God do it that way? Now, I've, I've read the Bible cover to cover a number of times, and it's possible I'm missing something. But as far as I can read in my Bible, God never says why. He just says, that's the way I did it. Because I'm God and you're not. I get to choose how I, if and how I deliver people from their sin. So God's plan for redemption begins with the nation of Israel. That's how you need to see what Jesus is saying here. First, let the children eat all they want. In other words, the kingdom of God is first revealed to the people of Israel. Now, What can we learn? What we can learn from that is that God moves according to His plans and purposes. Here is this woman who is pleading with Jesus to heal her daughter, and Jesus says, "Then the kingdom of heaven first goes to the people 
of Israel. In other words, God moves according to his plans and purposes, not at the whims of human beings. It is impossible, mark this well, it is impossible to force God into doing something. And some people think that if you pray a certain way, you know, if you're on one knee and you hold your finger up just the right way or you're holding the right trinket or you go through a certain ritual, that God has to do what you want. You know, just pray a certain way and God will do exactly what you want because you will then have control over God. No way. No way. God answers prayers according to His plans and purposes. God in His sovereignty, responds to our pleas in a way that is consistent with His agenda for the universe. That's how God answers prayer. That's how He answers our pleading. When I was on holiday, the first week of holiday, I I took some time and I got into a furniture project. I was building a cabinet for our home for the kids to store all their stuff in. And sometimes when I'm doing work around the house, my kids will excitedly say to me something like, can I help? Which in one hand makes me very happy and proud, and another hand makes me very nervous about what's about to come. And so I, I always try and think of something safe for them to do. And this, uh, on this particular occasion, I, I thought, you know what? Sanding is a great idea for the children. So they, they, they pleaded, can I help? Can, I, can, can we please help? And so I made little sanders for them all, and they, uh, most of them lasted about 30 seconds of sanding. <laughs> and then they gave up. Jillian persevered, though. She was with me the whole time. Like, the entire day, it was amazing. And uh, they, uh, in, in one part, I, I got out a, a, a little bit of a power tool. It's called an orbital sander. And they were super excited. Like, Dad, can we try the sander? <laughs> And I was a little bit uh, hesitant, but uh, I said, okay. So they were really excited and pleaded to help. Now, what if they had come to me and asked me for a hammer? As Kevin often does as the boy (laughs) in the family. Can I help, Dad? Can I have the hammer? (laughs) I would have said, no way, man, because you know exactly what's going to happen. He's going to take the hammer and he's going to pound it into the nice finished part of the wood right? So I'm trying to answer my children's pleas in a way that is consistent with what I'm trying to accomplish. You see? That's how it is with God. We may find it offensive that God chose Israel to be His people and that the Gentiles, for the most part, remained separate prior to the time of Christ. But that's the way God has accomplished His plan. And thankfully, because of the work of Christ on the cross, all people, Jew and Gentile, have the opportunity, according to 1 John 3, 1, to be called, not dogs, but the children of God. God works according to His plans and purposes. We may find it discouraging when God seems to be ignoring our pleas, but we need to know that He has a purpose. And let us not become weary. Let us not become discouraged in pleading with God because it's not turning out our way. Let us persevere in our pleading. Let us persevere in our prayers to God, knowing that God has a purpose, knowing that He has a plan, that He will bring it about for our good and for His glory. Just as a small caveat here, I often hear people pray something like, Lord, would you do such and such if it be your will? I understand the sentiment of that, but nobody prays like that in the Bible. Nobody nobody has a like a a side exit in their prayers in the Bible. No, they just come and they passionately plead with God and then they wait for God to respond. That's what we should do. Yes, we know that God has plans and purposes and that He will do all that He pleases and He does not answer to our whims, but He allows us to come and plead and He will answer according to His plans and purposes. We don't need to tell Him to do His will. We just need to plead with Him and enjoy as His will is revealed. Instead of... Instead of qualifying or trying to twist God's God's arm into doing something, let us plead with Him and expect Him to answer according to His plans 
and purposes. What a great privilege it is to plead with God, the God of the universe who can do all things. Jesus teaches us on a number of occasions to be persistent in our pleading. It's often difficult. It's often heart-wrenching. And it's often, there are often times where the answer seems to be no, but my, my plea with you this morning is that we would be persistent in our pleas with God. Let us fervently plead with God. Whatever our circumstance may be, whether it be a job or whether it be a family member or whether it be a health concern, let us plead. Let us plead with Him. Jesus reminds us here that our pleading, God's response to our pleas are based on His plans and purposes. But there's one more thing in this text that's glorious. We get it from the woman's response to what Jesus says to her. Says to her. Here's the third thing, is that God delights in humbly pleading with Him. When we come before the throne of God, when we're pleading with Him, when we're praying to Him, we should do so based on His promises rather than our own merit. God delights in humbly pleading with Him. Have you ever been insulted in your life? Have you ever been called a name? If you've been insulted or ever been called a name, then you know the feeling of anger that often is associated with that. You know the feeling of offense that often accompanies being insulted. Typically, when we're insulted, we want to throw back an insult or we want to inflict harm. Or we want to defend ourselves. We want to show that the insult or the accusation is not true. Not this woman. That's not how she responds to Jesus. Jesus calls her a dog. <laughs> Husbands, never say that to your wife. You... <laughs> and look at the way she responds in verse 28. Yes, Lord, she replied. But even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Yes, Lord. She agrees with Jesus. This is extraordinary. This woman is absolutely extraordinary in the Gospel of Mark. Here Jesus gives this one verse parable about children and eating bread and, and dogs. It's a parable about Israel and the Gentiles. And she understands the parable. Have you noticed so far in the Gospel of Mark, no one understands Jesus' parables? She understands it. Extraordinary. Not only does she understand it, she agrees with the parable. She agrees with what Jesus is calling her. And then she says this. She says, yes, Lord. You know, in all the uses of the word Lord in the Gospel of Mark, she is the only person to use it of the Lord Jesus. In the whole Gospel. She's the only one that calls Jesus Lord. She's the only one who recognizes His right to rule and reign over all things, especially her circumstances. She's the only one in the whole Gospel. She recognizes Jesus' power, His authority, and His position. What is she doing? She is humbling herself. She is making herself low. And she is exalting Christ. Not what you would expect from a Gentile woman from a, an area that is thoroughly idolatrous, that worships false gods, that knows nothing of the Scriptures. Here's this woman who gets it. Amazing. She clearly understands the parable that first, first in priority is the children of Israel. She agrees with it, and then she applies... She applies Jesus' parable to her own situation. Look, she applies it. She says, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. You know, in, in Israel, most dogs were, were street dogs. 
And, and, and so the image of a dog is really quite bad. But in, in Gentile circles, especially in Greek circles, sometimes they would keep dogs as house pets. Now anybody who has both a dog and young children completely gets what she, how she's applying the parable here. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times in our household, I think I say it daily, eat over your plate! Why don't you eat over your plate? Because what happens is children are eating their plate, you know, they're eating over their laps and it ends up all over the table, it ends up over the floor and you've got the floor all covered with crumbs and with food. This is the one redeeming feature of a dog. (laughs) Is that it will eat those crumbs and you don't have to sweep or you don't have to vacuum quite as often. What she's saying here is saying some important things about what Jesus has said to her. You see, if there's crumbs falling from the table, what does that mean about the meal? It means that it's a bountiful feast. I can tell you if my children were starving, they would not waste the crumbs on their plate. They would not fall to the floor. And if they did fall to the floor, they would use the five-second rule, quickly get down, pick it up, and eat it. There would be no crumbs. Things that are spilling over from the table means that there's a a bountiful feast that Jesus has set. In other words, she's recognizing the abundance of power in the Lord Jesus. We know that from Mark's Gospel. How many miracles has Jesus performed in the first seven chapters of this book? How many people have seen it? How many people have enjoyed the healing? How many times have we read in the Gospel that all the people that come to the Lord Jesus, all of them are healed? Thousands of people. It's a bountiful feast. There's a high number of miracles. It's a display of God's inexhaustible power. And she's acknowledging that. She's acknowledging a bountiful feast. She's also demonstrating a great amount of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because of what she's asking for. It's just a crumb. What's she saying there? This is easy for you to do this, Jesus. This is not a hard thing for you to do. This is completely within your power. This is a thing of ease for you to accomplish this for my daughter. This unlikely woman from a Greek culture knowing nothing of the Scriptures as far as we know, living amongst idolatry, realizes the Lordship of Jesus and conveys a great deal of faith in His power to accomplish anything that He chooses. She's an astounding woman and her faith is flowing out of her humility yes lord you're right i'm the dog in the picture i'm the dog and all i'm asking for is a crumb look at how jesus responds then he told her for such a reply one filled with humility and with faith you may go the demon has left your daughter she went home and found her child lying on the bed, and the demon was gone. Her humility and her faith that grows out of her humility pleases Christ, and He grants her request. Notice that Jesus remains where He is for the miracle. Again, the only time this happens in Mark's Gospel. Yes, it happened other times in Jesus' ministry, but this is the only time Mark records it happening, that he performs a miracle from a distance. All the other miracles that we've seen, Jesus has come to the person or the people come to Him. They're in His presence, not this time. Jesus performs the miracle from a distance. He simply says, go, the demon has left. And then look at her display of faith. What does she do? She doesn't say, Lord, no, 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 you don't understand. You need to come with me to heal my daughter. No, she doesn't say, she doesn't say that. What does she do? She goes. Another act of faith. And what does she find there? She finds her daughter, peaceful, lying on the bed. The demon is gone. She doesn't ask the Lord to come. She doesn't tell him her daughter's name or where she is. She simply responds in faith and returns home and finds her daughter healed. 
She simply believes that Jesus has the power to heal from a distance. She believes that he possesses the knowledge as to who she is, as to where she is, and he possesses the power to heal her no matter where she is or no matter who she is. This woman who lives amongst constant godlessness is, it seems to me, one of the greatest examples, if not the greatest example of faith in the whole Gospel of Mark. She displays more understanding and faith than even Jesus' closest followers, his disciples. And when I read about her, I'm reminded of what Peter says in 1 Peter 5.5, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The Lord would have been right and just to reject her request. He owes her nothing. She doesn't deserve this miracle because of her own merit. She's a Gentile idolater as far as we know. But rather, God is pleased to grant what she is pleading for because of her humble faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is an important lesson for us, and we would be wise to take it to heart, to take every opportunity to plead with God. Rather than coming and making demands of God, rather than acting entitled or becoming angry when God says no, let us plead in humility. Let us understand that God owes us nothing. Let us not plead on our own merit, but let us plead with God upon His greatness and upon His grace. Let us plead for God's glory rather than our own. By the blood of Christ, He permits us to come into His throne room, Hebrews 10, to draw near to Him and to pour out our hearts to Him. And my hope for this text is that it is sparking in your heart the same thing that it has sparked in mine. A renewed desire to earnestly plead with God. I think one of my greatest failings as a Christian, one of my greatest failings as a pastor, as your pastor, is my failure to plead with God for you that Christ would be formed in your heart, that you would grow in Him, that we would all grow together in unity for His glory and the goodness of the Gospel in our community. Let's not waste it. Let's not waste it. God allows us to come and to plead with Him. We know that He will answer our pleas based on His plans and purposes. And brothers and sisters, most importantly, let's come to Him in humility as we plead with Him on our behalf and on the behalf of others. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You for recording this account of this extraordinary woman a woman who we wouldn't expect to exude such faith and humility in the Lord Jesus. Oh God, I'm humbled by her example. I'm humbled by her example because of how much of Your Word I have access to. I'm humbled by her example because of how humble she is in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh God, I pray that her example would be one that we would embrace one of humility and faith before your throne constantly. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.